Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I want to tell you the story of Soyuz 4 and 5, one of the great close calls in space history. This guy is Vladimir Shatilov. He's about to get on board Soyuz number 4 for an attempt at a rendezvous in docking. This would become the first docking by a Soyuz in space. In fact, the name Soyuz means union in Russian, so I guess a docking is a kind of union. Now, this was Soyuz 4. Soyuz 1 had, of course, gone tragically wrong. It was supposed to be a docking and a rendezvous, but uh, had, hadn't had worked and Vladimir Komarov had died during descent. Soyuz 2 was launched as a target for Soyuz 3. They achieved a rendezvous, but the pilot was unable to actually dock. So on January 14th, 1969, Soyuz 4 launched into orbit and then spent a day waiting until Soyuz 5 would launch. And it would be crewed by these three. The commander would be Boris Volnyov in the middle, on the right you've got Evgeny Krunov, and on the left you've got Alexei Yelisev, who you'll notice doesn't have a badge on his fur hat, and that's because instead of being ex-military, he was uh, an engineer who graduated into the cosmonaut program. Boris Volnyov was actually a part of the original cosmonaut group, selected alongside Yuri Gagarin. In fact, he's the only one of that group who is still alive today. Unfortunately, he kept on missing opportunities to fly. On Voskhod 1, he was on the primary crew, but then for political reasons, he was bumped in part because of his Jewish ancestry. Then he was scheduled to be on Voskhod 3, but then Sergei Korolev died and the mission was cancelled 10 days before launch by Vasily Mishin. And if you think that all sounds like bad luck, well, you haven't heard anything yet. Soyuz 5 would launch on January 15th, 1969 and head into an orbit that had matched planes with Soyuz 4. For the next day, they would attempt to rendezvous and bring themselves close to Soyuz 4 so that the two spacecraft could dock. Now, the early Soyuz docking system was a simple probe and drogue type mechanism that would pull the spacecraft together and make electrical connections so that they could communicate and, you know, mate the spacecraft together. Unlike the modern Soyuz docking mechanism, there was no hatch, there was no tunnel between the two spacecraft after docking. So they were still very much separate spacecraft as far as the crew were concerned. The big thing about this mission is they didn't just want to dock and show that they were docked, because after all, Gemini had done that. They wanted to transfer crew from one spacecraft to another. That's why Soyuz 5 had launched with three crew and Soyuz 4 had launched with one. So the two extra crew would have to get on spacesuits and EVA across the gap to the other spacecraft. This was only the second spacewalk that had been performed by the Soviet Union. The previous one was, of course, Voskhod 2 with Alexei Leonov that had happened four years earlier. And he had got into a situation where he was struggling to get back inside the spaceship. So the new suits were the Yastreb, or Hawk, and the modular design of the Soyuz allowed Boris Volnyov to remain in the descent module with the hatch closed while the orbit module was used as an airlock. The mission planning had made sure that the EVA would take place over the Soviet Union could, so there could be live coverage. However, the cosmonauts had a camera they were supposed to carry with them and unfortunately it floated off into space. So all we have is this really low quality TV camera image from the spacewalk and on the left you have an animation that was shown to the general public so they could get an idea of the epic task that was happening in space. Also if you look carefully you'll notice that there's no life support backpacks. They do actually have portable life support systems but instead they carried those down around their legs which I, I thought is an interesting variation of the, the suit design. Once this EVA was complete, Soyuz 4 was repressurized, there was much celebration, and the two new crew members brought over newspaper clippings and postcards from the day after the launch of Soyuz 4. The entire docked operations would last less than five hours, and then Soyuz 4 and 5 would depart and spend another day or so in orbit. Soyuz 4 with the three crew would be the first to return home and it returned during some pretty cold weather. I hear it's something like minus 38 degrees and it doesn't matter if that's in Fahrenheit or centigrade, that's damn cold.
Soyuz 5 with Boris Volynov would remain in space for another day before preparing to return, and that's when the problems really started. Initially, he had problems getting the spacecraft aligned quickly enough so that he could take measurements, but eventually they decided to trigger a, an automated re-entry from the ground, and the re-entry process started. And at this point, what happened next wasn't well documented in the Soviet documentaries of the era. Instead, we have to switch to something more appropriate, Kerbal Space Program. Now, you probably know that the Soyuz is made of three separate modules, the Service Module, the Descent Module, and the Orbit Module. At this point, I believe it was standard practice for them to jettison the Orbit Module before performing their de-orbit burn so that the engines had less mass to push around and that gave them better safety margins. So after that would have been jettisoned, Volnyov would begin the de-orbit burn, which would slow him down so that he would land in the steppes of Kazakhstan. With the de-orbit burn complete and the spacecraft heading into the Earth's atmosphere, it was then time to get rid of the service module. So Boris activated the separation mechanism, he heard a thunk as explosive bolts fired, and then looked out the window and noticed that the antenna were still very much uh, there, the antenna that stuck out the front of the solar panels. So uh, he began to realize that the service module had not detached. It would later be discovered that the explosive bolts that were used were not up to the task. Also not up to the task was the attitude control system on the descent module. It was normally only designed to rotate a small object rather than the massive spacecraft. And the while the physical separation between the vehicles hadn't been achieved, the you know, power and the signals and the controls had all been separated. So it was essentially a descent module carrying this dead mass and they were heading into the atmosphere, they knew that the, the service module would be unable to survive the descent, but the descent module was well protected. It had a heat shield. It had six inches of ablative material on the bottom. You would normally lose about three inches during descent, but this is not a normal descent, and as the air pressure began to build up, the spacecraft, with its very weak reaction control thrusters, began to lose control and it turned aerodynamically into the airflow. And that meant the descent module with Boris was flying hatch first into the fury of re-entry and he was getting to see everything in front of him. Not only that, as the aerodynamic forces built up, instead of being pushed into his crash couch, he was being pulled forward against his straps. So he was pretty much able to stare exactly at the thing that was going to fail first during re-entry, the hatch. He didn't have a spacesuit, he had a wool flight suit and he knew that wouldn't protect him in any way at all. I actually got some photos inside a first generation Soyuz from the era. They have one at Chabot Space and Science Centre in Oakland. This is the front of the spacecraft and you can see, you know, there's a lot of exposed metal. If you look at the top there, that is the hatch and there's a small thin layer of ablative material on it. Not much at all to protect them. So literally facing down death, he did what any good cosmonaut would. He began to document the experience, hoping that the information would be useful. Uh, he, you know, he wrote notes, he um, recorded stuff on the voice recorder and he was worried about the notes surviving an impact. So he would... He ripped the notes out of the pages out of his book and he stuffed them as close to his person as possible, hoping that they would be somehow protected. And then as the air seals around the hatch began to burn and smoke was coming into the cabin, he, he heard one big thump and the service module broke away and detached and very rapidly the capsule flipped around and began to turn the correct way into the airstream. Finally facing into the fury of re-entry, the spacecraft was wobbling, but Boris was going to survive at least this long. The problem was the spacecraft was still very much spinning out of control. Without the attitude control system, had depleted all its propellant trying to control the uh, unwieldy vehicle. So he was spinning faster than he should have, and that meant that parachute deployment was going to be scary. Upon initial deployment, the parachute wires were twisted up by the rotation of the capsule, but then the capsule slowed down and began to spin the other way, and the parachute deployed a whole lot more. It wasn't perfect, but it was going to be enough to slow him down for a smooth landing. 
But the capsule was still rocking around, and when it got down to the surface, its retro jets fired not quite straight down, so he hit the ground very hard, bumped around in his seat, he smashed his face into the control panel, broke his jaw and several teeth, but he was alive. He was, however, alive, and in the moments of silence following the touchdown, he could hear the hiss of water being turned to steam by the hot surface of the spacecraft. Upon opening the hatch, he was showered with ash from the seal that had burned, and he was greeted to an outside temperature of about minus 40 degrees. A temperature at which it doesn't matter whether it's Fahrenheit or centigrade, it's too cold for him to go anywhere. There are a few historians that actually say he went and hiked to a nearby cabin. Uh, according to the man himself, he stayed with the, the spacecraft during this time, which seems like a good idea given that he didn't have any clothes other than a very light woolen flight suit. Because the spacecraft had performed a ballistic re-entry, it had ended up about 600 kilometers short of its original destination, but the rescuers were able to find him in a couple of hours, and apparently the first thing he said, he remembers saying to them is asking, does my hair look grey now? He also re recalls asking them if they had a cigarette, and lamenting the fact that they only had a shipka, which is apparently a very cheap brand of cigarette. Initially, doctors told him he would never fly again with his injuries, but he did actually fly again. He was a commander for Soyuz 21, which also had some technical issues. The crew got sick, they were forced to return early, and again on landing, it suffered a problem with the soft landing rockets and they had a pretty rough landing. Of course, the official stories of the era did not relate any of the problems of the Soyuz 5 descent. That was kept strictly secret. It only came to light years later, after, in fact, he had retired. And so, 50 years after his first flight into space in Soyuz 5, Boris Volonov remains the last of the first group of cosmonauts. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.